Before the elders get up here, um, Rachel shared with us a prayer request. Some of you guys know the Dean family, Alicia Dean. Uh, she's worked at Faulkner. Uh, this after, was it this afternoon? It's Rachel. Okay, this afternoon, um, she had a brain aneurysm when she was outside working in the yard, burning leaves, and she fell over in the fire as well. And it was about an hour before her husband found her. And so she's in the hospital um, undergoing treatment. She's in Dothan. Um, I know that they would certainly appreciate all the prayers for that, but that's Alicia Dean. Um, so if you know any of the family, want to check in on them and be praying for that, certainly. Um, but uh, that's a request that we want to bring before the church tonight. Tonight, the elders will be leading a time of worship tonight. Uh, after a couple songs, we'll uh, be led in a prayer by Bob, and then Robert will give us a message, and then uh, Bill will lead us in a closing prayer. We'll sing a couple songs to begin with. Let's stand and sing a couple songs back to back. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify.
Let us pray together. Holy Father, we come before your throne, your healing mercy seat, and thank you for the many blessings that we received, which fall down as rain from heaven. We know that the sparrow cannot fall to the ground without your notice, so you are aware of our trials and infirmities. And we pray for those of our number who are dealing with sickness and adversity. Help us to remember that doctors and medicine can do only so much to prolong our lives and relieve our sufferings. And in time, we must all leave this world, leave our friends and our families. But we have this promise in which you've made us, and we trust that you will raise us up from the dust in the last day and bring us to your everlasting home. So let us hold to that hope. This evening, we pray for our missionaries who are away from home and dealing with special circumstances in foreign lands. Bless Giff and John and Jared and Whitney that they may have continued success in their labors. And bless our brethren in Ukraine who are watching their country being ripped apart by a senseless war driven by an evil dictator who cares nothing for human life and nothing for you and your son. Bless Howell and Mary Ferguson and Nathan and Christie and all of our brethren in Chamala. And bless those in India and Indonesia who have so little of this world's goods but are rich in faith. And help us, O oh God, not to be led astray by the deceitfulness of our own possessions which would shipwreck our faith. Thank you for bringing us to our own time, giving us opportunities, and allowing us to live in this country, which in times past has been very good to those who wear your name. In our day, O oh Father, we witness in the dark forces of Satan, the vultures of secularism and depravity is ripping out the very heart of our nation, seeking to undo and uproot all the principles of Christianity which we know were at the front, the work of our founding fathers. Yes, we are appalled, O oh God, at the slaughter of innocents in the womb and the ungodly practice of same-sex unions, all now sanctioned by our government. We know that you are greatly displeased with us as a nation, and we tremble in fear that you will deal with us according to our collective wrongs. But we earnestly pray that for the sake of your people, for the sake of our children and our grandchildren, through your divine providence, you will spare us from the fate of so many nations in history that have gone before us. Will God raise up leaders who realize that righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people? Thank you for the guidance of your word. May remember that, uh, that as uplifting as it is for us to come together and worship and enjoy fellowship, that we must live our lives outside the walls of this building. Help us, therefore, to conduct ourselves in such a way that we will be a blessing to you and our fellow man. Help us to always study your word that we may grow, and we know that we are weak in faith, faith and help us to be strong in faith and to believe, even when it is hard to believe. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't you love that noise? This is great. Get over with. Uh, give me just a minute. <clears throat> oh, good. Okay. I, I want to say thank you, first of all, to, to Steve uh, for those songs that you led, Steve, and, and certainly also to Bob for that powerful, meaningful prayer. We very much appreciate these men, and, and in just a, a bit, we're going to 
to hear a prayer from Bill after I get done. But but thank you all for being here, uh, each one of you. We really appreciate it. Can you hear me okay in the back? Uh, let's say we're good. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm very appreciative of y'all being here. We're going to take tonight to utilize this time to point out a few things that shepherds have been concerned about that, that we want to make sure we've talked with you all about to share some of our thoughts uh, regarding that. So uh, tonight's lesson is, is titled Connections, and you'll see why that word fits in, in just a few minutes. But certainly we've used these times in other ways and, and other times, and I appreciate what we're doing on Sunday evenings to be able to utilize some different formats because I think different formats might be more meaningful for certain things we're trying to do. And, um, and, and I think we've done that and appreciative for the guys that organize the other Sunday nights that, that we meet on and, and the work that they put into it because certainly there is work and effort that goes into the organization of those kinds of things. All right, well, let's, let's talk about connections. And, and the first thing I want to make mention of, and, and it's just a bit of a rhetorical question to begin with, but the question is, have you, you personally ever felt the heartache of trying to make a connection? And I'm talking about a personal connection with someone. It may be one-on-one, -on -one, it may be with a group, uh, it may be some other way, but think about if you've ever had that, if you've ever felt that or, or had that situation. <clears throat> You know, we probably all have, right? I mean, at some point in our lives and, and in some way, uh, we've experienced some of that, that pain. And, and maybe not now, but maybe some other time in your life, or maybe it, maybe it is now. But we, we've all had um, that at some point. Now, we all need to make connections. And, and if you're not feeling that right now, it may be because you already have connections, right? But, uh, but we all need those kinds of connections. Certainly, we need those kinds of connections in Overcoming just direct loneliness. I mean, just just very much feeling lonely. And but we also need those kinds of personal connections. And when it comes time to sort of uh, deal with or address uh, conflicts that we might feel, you know, and we might have a conflict with another person, and we certainly need to address it in some way. And, and beyond just ignoring it, how do how do we address it? We're going to talk a bit about that tonight. And then. And then certainly we want to, to bring together, uh, I'll call it theology, we want to be able to bring together theology and loving actions to, to really sort of show the world that, that we're Christians. And um, the concept of doing that is, is not a foreign one, it's not a strange one, it's none of those things, but, uh, but it's something that I, I think it merits a little bit of time for us to rejoice about what has been done in that regard. And, how important that is. So, so these are the three things we're really going to try to talk about tonight. One about connections as regard to loneliness, one about connections as far as uh, the resolution of conflict, and then making the connection between theology, what we know, and, and hopefully what are our loving actions. So th those are the areas we're going to tonight. First, let's talk about overcoming loneliness. I don't know if you've ever Sometimes it's good just to kind of get away, right? I mean, to do something like this on a, on a beautiful day like today, sometimes that's very peace-inducing. But <clears throat> if, you're, if you're like this and, and you don't want to be like this and you're just alone and, and you wonder where everybody's at or why no one has reached out to you, this, this can be a very lonely time. So it depends on why you're sitting on that bench and looking off in the distance. You know, maybe it... Maybe it looks like this. Maybe you've sat somewhere out by some water somewhere and just pondered and just ached for a better relationship with somebody and uh, really, really felt that sting in, in some way in your life. And again, we've probably all been there at some point, but, but let's think about folks that might be there at this point. I do want to point out some verses. Thank God our God is a God of love who cares about us, who hears our prayers and and he wants to help us. And this particular verse from Psalm 147, verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. You can apply this verse in a lot of different ways. There are a lot of different ways to be brokenhearted and a lot of different things that can motivate you to be brokenhearted. But the bottom line to me of this verse in this context is that God cares if we're brokenhearted or not. 
The God of the universe cares if I'm broken whole. The God of the universe wants to bind up our wounds. He wants to help us, so he is not unconcerned about us. Quite the opposite. He is very concerned about us. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. If you've ever been lonely, it, it's pretty anxiety-provoking. Because you, do, you don't know when that's going to change. You, you don't know when things are going to get better. But again, thank God, he cares for us. He cares that we have those anxieties and, and, and wants to take them on for us. He wants us to cast those anxieties on him. You really have a loving God when you have a God that understands that sort of anxiety. Hebrews 13.5 I, speaking of God, will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. One of my favorite concepts in the Bible is that God never changes. God never changes. Brothers, we, we live in a world that's just spinning, right? And <laughs> figuratively and literally. But but some would say spinning out of control, and Bob sort of alluded to some of that in his prayer. But, but we have a lot of different things going on in our world, and very few things that are just sort of locked down certain. Well, God is locked down certain. He, he doesn't change. And, and that can be reassuring when we're lonely, that God cares about us, and God wants to help us. God wants to hear from us. And God cares. I'm thankful that God says he'll never desert us. So if you're feeling lonely tonight, please remind yourself that God doesn't desert you, that God does care about you and will always be there. A few more verses. Uh, Romans 12, uh, 4 and 5. <clears throat> For just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Part of overcoming loneliness is recognizing that, that we live in a body. We live in a family. We each have different roles. We have different parts to play, different situations and that. But we're all part of that body. And, and even though you may not <clears throat> look like me, speak like me, talk like me, etc., we're a part of the same group. We're united in Christ. Excuse me. <clears throat> and by being united, we, we should also be concerned. I mean, we should be concerned about every part of the body. Every part. Romans 12.10 says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, give preference to one another in honor. In other words, this is not just a, being concerned about our brother and sister in Christ is not just a nice add-on if you can get it. No, we're, we're commanded to do that. We're commanded to be concerned. We're commanded to be devoted to one another. And, and that's a, a pleasant charge, should be a pleasant charge. Sometimes it's hard, but it's important. And then finally, Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. I should be concerned enough to help you bear your burdens. You should be concerned enough to help me bear my burdens. You may or may not know what they are. I may or may not know what yours are, but that doesn't mean I don't want to help. And oh, that we would all want to help one another bear our burdens. That's certainly what we're called to do. But if you've ever felt the heartache of loneliness, you, you wonder about what's really happening, what's really going on. You know, that, that heartache of loneliness, really there's nothing else quite like it. And, and many of us have been in that situation at one time or another for one reason or another, but, but we need to be concerned about it. But I have had, and the elders have heard from some brethren uh, who've told us here from time to time here at Del Rado that they feel very lonely. And you go, well, how on earth could that happen? I mean, I'm not lonely. Great. I'm glad you're not lonely. That doesn't mean somebody's not lonely. And, and we need to be aware that, that 
that happens. And, and sometimes it, it happens because something has happened to your partner or your spouse or whatever in life and your friend. And, and that can happen. Certainly we have people that, that go to church with us that their, their spouse has passed away. And, and they feel lonely. They feel sometimes, again, desperately lonely. Sometimes their spouse has not passed away, but maybe they're suffering from the ravages of, of dementia. And they're there, but they're, but they're not there, at least not in the way they've been there through most of their lives. And maybe that affects you in a marital relationship. Maybe that affects you in a family relationship, a member of your family. That's painful and lonely. Some of us are suffering through the fact that our spouses have chosen not, chosen not to come to assemblies anymore. And I'm not talking about those that are physically unable to come. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about ones that have actively chosen not to come. And yes, you end up coming and coming by yourself. It's almost like you're a single person, but you're not single. And you know that. And a lot of people know that. But you feel that loneliness acutely in that situation. Maybe, maybe you've been through a breakup. Maybe it's just a dating relationship or some other sort of friendship. And you went through a breakup and Maybe it's a breakup with a family member. That's a, a loneliness and, and a heartache that some of us have felt. Maybe a person is so introverted that they have trouble reaching out. They, they really just, it just doesn't come easily for them. And for those of you that that comes easily for, I'm very happy for you. Um, but it's not that way for everyone. Some, some people have actually told us that they've tried to reach out, um, but, but somebody's not reached back. They've tried to be friendly. Now, to what degree, I, you know, I can't judge every situation. We can't judge every situation, but they think they've tried, and, and, and it's painful for them when, when they feel like no one has really reached back. Maybe, maybe it was a simple sentence or two, but it merited a response of some sort. Maybe it was something deeper than that, and they would like to have had a more of a conversation than that, and we need to be aware of that, that we have people like that. Now, our first impulse might be to sort of react defensively, right, and, and say, well, you know, uh, they had the opportunity or, um, you know, we might just say, well, they're just kind of awkward socially. Well, if you've never seen a person who's awkward socially, you, you have now. That's me. <laughs> okay. I can promise you there are many situations where I feel very, very awkward. May, not, may, may or may not look that way. I feel it. And that kind of awkwardness is, is a challenge. You know? I'm very thankful that when I put myself out there at Del Rita, people have responded back. And many of you could tell a story just like that. And we thank God for those people. But, but you may have, someone else might have put themselves out there and not had that sort of response. And uh, we need to be aware of that. Sometimes people in that situation feel like they're unseen, and because of that, it's that much more painful. But we all need to be actively looking for those kinds of folks. We all need to be proactive, make conversation, ask questions, further a conversation, try to be engaged. And every one of us has failed at that at one time or another or multiple times, but that doesn't mean we can't try again. And, and we really need to try again. We really need to, to reach out and proactively address those kinds of situations because the, the need is, is very real. My wife used this term, and I like the term. It probably wasn't original to her, but I think it says it well. And some people are noticers. You notice things, and you notice that somebody's struggling in some way. My wife is one of those people. But, but being a noticer is a powerful thing in the body of Christ. I really want to encourage all of us to be noticed, to be people that care enough to notice, to take the time. Is it always convenient? No. No, most of the time it's not convenient. Most of the time it happens at the most inconvenient time. That doesn't mean it's not important. I just want to encourage us to be noticers, particularly of individuals that, that might be feeling lonely. Let's talk about making connections to overcome conflicts. I think I might have said this a bit ago, but I'll say it again. 
let's recognize that, that we may know a lot of things, but unless we put them into action, we really don't have a good theology. A good theology is you know it, and you have the loving actions that go along with it. That's good theology. And we all want that. We all want to aspire to that. But let's keep that in the forefront of our minds. We've got to make a connection between what we know and, and what we do. Over the past few weeks, I've had a couple of times to be in front of the college class, and the college class has been studying Romans, and Romans has a lot of discussion about the word faith and helping all of us to sort of think about the word faith being more than just belief. I, I like to go to James 2 because it helps tie those together. So when you read James 2, verses 19 through 22, it says, You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. I underline that last part because another word instead of perfected might be completed. Right? You, you put those two together. You put together the belief. You put together the belief with the action, and, and really you have faith. And that, that's what faith is about. And we don't want to lose sight of that. So, so where we fall down on our actions, we, we fall down on having a completed or perfected faith. And, and we want to work on that. And we want to encourage ourselves individually and encourage others individually in that regard. Um, but we really do need to, con to connect the things taught in the Bible with how we act. Brother Bill Johnson, just a week or two ago, he preached a sermon up focusing primarily on 1 Corinthians 13, and I really appreciated Bill's sermon, but one of the things Bill pointed out during that sermon was, as the Scripture points out, if we have all knowledge about the Scripture, but we don't have love, we're nothing. And, and that sometimes can be painful to hear, but it's true. And, and we just need to remind ourselves of that. Now, now why talk about all this? Why, why bring all this up? Well, Many of you know that, that we've had several families that have left us at Del Rey recently. And we're all concerned about that. We certainly want to wish everyone the best and wish them the best. And we're very sensitive to that. Um, but some of the things, some of the reasons I point, have pointed out, not all of them, these are not all the reasons. Bill addressed some of them last week. I'll address some of them tonight. We'll probably address others in the future. But... I do want to take on a few tonight, but one of the reasons that they pointed to is, is conflict with other members. And I guess more specifically, you might say unresolved conflict. <clears throat> now, have you, think about yourself, have you ever experienced conflict with a brother or sister in Christ? And I would venture to say every one of us would say yes in some way, somehow, right? that we have, we certainly would not have been the first one to have experienced that sort of conflict, and we're not going to be the last ones to experience that sort of conflict. And, and I also want to point out it's, it's everywhere. It's not unique to Del Rita, and it's just part of people and, and dealing with people and relating with one another. So let's be sensitive to the fact that there's conflict out there, and, and we need to think about, well, how do we, how do we deal with it? Well, you know, the Bible really anticipates this sort of thing. God's not surprised, right, this happens. And fortunately, he's given us verses and teachings that help us to understand how to deal with these kinds of things. And we'll look at some of those together with you tonight. Philippians 4, verses 2 through 3. I urge Euodia and I urge Synchtichi to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Now, these two women weren't getting along for whatever reason. We don't know the reason, but they weren't getting along. But, but, but God, through the hand of Paul here, is encouraging these women to come together, to work together in the Lord, and recognize that what we have in the Lord is a bigger deal. And, and it is extremely important that we work together in the Lord. And, and I'm thankful that so many do work together in the Lord here. But we need to recognize that 
conflict is, is not unexpected, but we've got to deal with it and deal with it biblically. How would the Lord have us to, to deal with it? Romans twelve sixteen says, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. It is so easy to think my way is the right way. You know, it's so easy to think that I'm smarter than everybody else, and I've got it figured out, and if you're doing something different, your way's not as smart as mine. Brethren, that attitude is not a Christian virtue. And we need to be aware of that. Now, there is a right, there is a wrong. Scripture tells us what rights and wrongs are, and we need to study that. But how we address one another, how we deal with that, Scripture also addresses that. And, and we need to be aware of that in terms of are we doing it biblically. Romans 15, verse 7 says, Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. We need to remember that Christ has accepted obedient servants of his that are not perfect. We've, we are all there, right? We've all been there. And those of us that are in Christ, we've had our sins forgiven, and we can have we have a right relationship with God. And, and as long as we continue to walk in the light, we continue that right relationship with God. But we need to remember Christ accepted us. We've got to be willing to accept other people and, and deal with other people and the challenges that they might bring with them. Galatians 5, 14 through 15. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word <clears throat> in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Again, these are not theoretical concerns. I mean, these are real life considerations. And we don't want to bite and devour one another. We just don't want to do that. People can become very smug about things. They can become, or at least demonstrate, or have their actions interpreted by somebody else as being, quote, holier than thou. Well, none of us want to be guilty of that. But, but we need to be sensitive that we might come across that way, and we don't want to come across that. Verses like this in Galatians 5 is, is sort of encouraging along that line. You know, we don't want to bite and devour each other, and we don't want to certainly be consumed by one another. And then finally, Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Let's be concerned about other people. Hold them up as being a great value. <clears throat> I've tried to convert this into some practical stuff. <clears throat> so I have six steps that you can consider. There's nothing magic about these, but there are verses behind each one of these, and we're going to look at the verses in just a few minutes. You know, first, take the initiative to resolve conflict. Second, focus on goals bigger than your personal differences. Third, listen attentively as the other person tells you how he or she sees the situation. Fourth, tell your story. Fifth, apologize and ask forgiveness for your part in the disagreement. And sixth, discuss how to avoid future conflict. These are all built on biblical principles, and we're going to look at those uh, individually. So let's do that now. Let's, let's take the first one. <clears throat> I would say the moment you sense there's a problem in the relationship, try to act on it. Proactively act on it. And I, I don't mean react, or to be negative, but, but try to think about how can I help this situation? How can we help uh, make it better, make it what it ought to be, and diffuse it in the right way, in a godly way? You know, even if you think the other person was wrong, and even if you don't think you've done anything to cause it, it doesn't mean you can't go first in trying to resolve. I really want to encourage us to face one another face-to-face -face about these sorts of things. Or text or email or that sort of thing. Even a telephone call is better than a text. But, but there's nothing that replaces a face-to-face -face conversation. Because it's only in a face-to-face -face conversation that you see somebody's eyes, you see somebody's expression, you see their sigh or hear their sigh, just their general body language. And, 
I think these kinds of conversation are best one-on-one -on -one or, or in face-to-face -face situations at the very least. I was talking to a counselor one time, uh, Sam Bushell might tell you this, uh, if I spoke to Sam, I don't think I got this from Sam, but I got it from another counselor one time, and, um, and that person talking about two Christians relating together who were having some sort of disagreement, uh, the counselor said, all right, the most mature Christian go first in resolving this. Now, if that doesn't motivate you, <laughs> you, know, you want to be the most mature, right? So... So hopefully you're going to take a proactive step and, and sort of sense it in that way. But Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar in there, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Now this is not saying, well, worship's unimportant, go take care of the other thing. No, it's saying worship is very important and it is so important that you need to approach it correctly. Well, part of approaching it correctly is go and resolve your issue that you have with another brother, and then come back and worship. Number two, focus on goals bigger than your personal differences. I would say probably the, the biggest thing you can do in these sorts of discussions is, is up front indicate that you do not devalue the other person. Don't devalue them as a person. They they have lives. They have concerns like you have concerns. And we don't need to devalue the other person. When you're, when you're trying to work things out, if, if it comes across that you devalue them as a person, you're probably not going to be very successful in, in the biblical point and the conflict resolution you're trying to get to. And, and at the very least, you failed in valuing the other person if that happens. So, so let's remember to value the other people in Ephesians 4, 3. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We, we want to work at unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And a lot of work goes into that very simple statement. <clears throat> Number three, listen attentively as the other person tells how he or she sees the situation. Proverbs 18, 3. He who gives an answer before he hears it is folly and shame to him. You know, we really need to let the other person speak first. Let the other person explain why are their feelings hurt, what, what has bothered them, what is the conflict that they feel, and we need to listen. And just listen. Let them, let them say what they've got to say and get it out. Now, you might ask a clarifying question. I mean, not a I got you question, but a, but a clarifying question to make sure you understand what it is that they feel this conflict about. And, and I think we can benefit from doing that sort of thing. Um, it's important not to interrupt them while this is going on. And, you know, and then we ask, will they listen to you? And hopefully they will. We've already read Proverbs 18, James 1, 19 through 20. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. We don't want to stimulate anger. It's not about anger. It's about resolving whatever the issue is. Number four is tell your story. Ask the other person, will they listen to your, your part of this in terms of what's going on? You know, indicate to them, well, I, I've heard you, and you, and I think I understand what you're saying. Would you be willing to listen to me? And usually they're, they're going to say yes. And in that conversation, if the blame is on the problem, try not to associate blame so much with individuals, but, but try to work on the problem. But it is okay to let the other person know that you've been hurt in some way. Right? You've been affected by what has gone on. We definitely want to encourage that. So Proverbs 18, 17, the first to plead his case seems right until another comes along and examines him. There are, there are two sides to any story. And, and it's good for us to hear both sides. Apologize and ask forgiveness for your part in the disagreement. Sometimes that's disarming. Sometimes it's at least surprising to the other person that, that you've apologized about your part. And you, get, you may go, well, my part's that big. Okay, well, your part's that big. Apologize for it. You know, we each have some responsibility in, in disagreements. There's always two sides. 
So let's be willing to apologize for what we've done, what our part is in this, while we're also talking about uh, the particular issue. Um, now, the other person may never say they're sorry. They may never say that. What does Romans 12 say? And as far as it depends on you, what? Be at peace with all men. Be at peace with all men. Well, it depends on more than just you, right? But as far as it depends on you, be at peace with people. But, but if the other person never says they're sorry, well, they never say they're sorry. That doesn't mean I didn't do what was wrong. I'm trying to ask for their forgiveness. Now, if they ask for forgiveness, forgive. Jesus taught us to do that. But to forgive without a, well, you know, I, this is tentative forgiveness. This is, I'm going to watch you until next time or whatever, or whatever your other agenda might be. That's not forgiveness in the biblical sense. Colossians 3, 12 through 13. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Again, the reminder, the Lord forgave us. We have that similar attitude. And then talk about, well, how we're going to avoid this in the future. <clears throat> you know, if you can say, well, you know, we've dealt with this conflict. Maybe this is what we did today was a good way to resolve a conflict. And if something comes up in the future, we'll do it this way in the future. Or maybe, maybe, no, it wasn't a good way, but we've learned a better way. We'll do that next time. And, <clears throat> and if possible, close it out in prayer. Share a prayer to the Lord over the conflict you're resolving with a brother or sister. Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And I underline makers. You know, a peacekeeper is one who just tries to keep things from blowing up. I've been guilty of that in my life. That's not healthy. Being a peacemaker is hard work. How do I get in there, work on actually getting to a solution? That's what is blessed in the Beatitude. So let's keep, keep that in mind. You know, dealing with conflict in, in Christ's way is, is healthy. Dealing with conflict in Christ's way is can help us all grow spiritually and and to be able to move forward. Um, communicating in a peaceful, loving manner is, is powerful. Now, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is, is Satan's way. And when you do things Satan's way, what do you get? You get unrest. You get disunity. Anger, revenge, gossip. You can fill in a lot of different words. We don't want to give Satan an open door. Now, <clears throat> Let's get more specific about Del Rey here for a couple of minutes. Two of the things that we've heard the most of lately, I don't know about the most, but we've certainly heard it more than once, is that there's been conflict regarding who works outside the home in a family and why. Another area that we've heard conflict about that's existed among some folks is about how to provide for their children's academic education. Even if we think we have the best way about these sorts of things, we're not to deride our brother. That, that again, is not a Christian virtue. If our brother makes a different decision, we're not to make fun of them, we're not to run them down. They made a different decision, made a different choice. Deriding our brothers and sisters is not dealing with conflict in Christ's way. Biting and devouring each other does open the doorway for Satan. We want to do that. Let's talk a little bit more about these issues in particular, regarding mothers in particular working outside the home. You know, the Bible tells us about the Proverbs 31 woman. We've all read that and admire it. All of us have admired that woman that's described there, and we're aware that she did business transactions and made money. But that passage never says you must or you must not work outside the home. It doesn't say that. Apparently, based on Proverbs 31, it is possible to be a keeper at home, as we're told in the New Testament, but to also be doing business. So there is an example of that. Again, you don't have to, but it is possible. Let's talk about academic education for our children. You know, the Bible does talk about our responsibility as Christian parents to educate our children about the Bible, about God, 
demonstrate an appropriate Christian life before them. But the Bible doesn't really tell us much about educating our children on non-biblical topics. Think about it. There have been centuries where people didn't have any sort of formal education. Well, it doesn't mean there weren't Christians during those centuries. There were. Even in my own personal family, we, we had three children. Some of our children were educated in, I guess, what you would call traditional education, and some were educated in homeschooling. And we actually have one child who was partly traditional and partly homeschooled, so we've kind of done all of those. Um, I, I would say this very clearly, though, and that is that we weren't sinning in any of these educational methods. It's not sinful one way or the other. It's a, it's a strategy, isn't it? Frankly, the, the right answer may vary per child. The right answer may vary per what's going on in your family at a time. The right answer may vary depending on what phases your child goes through. There are different right answers, but you're not sinning either way. The final section I want to talk about here, and that is about, again, connecting theology and loving actions to tell the world that we're Christians. I want to take a moment to talk about Dalreda again. But I want you to know that this should be so encouraging to you because of so many things that we've seen at Dalreda. At Dalreda, there are some marvelous Christian servants. People that ought to put wind in our sails. We could all fill in a name, multiple names, of people like that. I won't call them out right now because I don't usually want that sort of recognition, but, but there are individuals here that so encourage me and I know have encouraged you in terms of the service that they've offered God and have been so uplifting in their example. And we need to celebrate that and, and be uh, rec recognized that that's certainly true. I don't know that those things necessarily are easy for every one of them. I, I suspect some of them it's probably easy as breathing and others they really have to work at it. But either way, they're, they're doing what's good. They're bringing glory to the Father and praise God for them. Praise God for the examples that they are. They do it anyway. On a, on a bigger group level at Del Rey, we've got some pretty phenomenal things going on. You know, we've had a food bank for decades. Food bank recognizing that there's a need for food and some people in our brotherhood, but also in our community and service that's been going on in that regard for, for a long time. We have a teddy bear ministry where so many of the ladies of the congregation put together teddy bears that are then distributed to children who visit an ER at our community hospital. <coughs> it's not a teddy bear for teddy bear's sake. It's got our name on it. It's got our contact information on it. It's got other written, written materials that go with it to tell people more about the Lord and about Del Rado, and we appreciate that. I want to talk about showers and teas. Uh, there, there's one this afternoon. But those things are so important in the life of a congregation, those kinds of social activities. And I'm very thankful that they go on and thankful for the women that put so much work into seeing that those things happen and benefit other people. Shifting gears, I want to talk about IT work. I appreciate these guys that do so much of the IT work for us. I can promise you if you depended on me, we would not have PowerPoint tonight, okay? Uh, but I appreciate the fact that there are people that do that. I, I cannot tell you, I've visited so many shut-ins in the past year or two. Repeatedly, I've heard how valuable live streaming is to those people. You can't help but think that it would be. Thank God that we live in a time where you can do that, and you can feel connected to a congregation if you have people there that put the work in to do it, and, and we do. Uh, I don't know how many social groups there are that meet here, three or four, maybe, I don't know, maybe a lot more than that. But I'm aware of three or four that meet together socially just to, you know, have coffee together. Or maybe they have a Bible study that's constructed, but, uh, but they, they spend time together and, and get to know one another better. I'm thankful for those groups. And if you're not part of one of those and you want to be part of one of those, let us know, you know certainly. A lot of shared meals. There's a lot of mission work that goes on around the world because of this congregation. But there's also a lot of mission work that goes on in Montgomery, sharing the gospel because of this congregation. That's powerful. I'm very thankful for that. I think most of you all know we have very wonderful college ministry. It's touched a lot of lives over the years, touches a lot of lives right now. 
and it is just so well done and it's such a positive uplift and just it encourages many of us who really aren't directly affected by college ministry at all but but it is an encouragement to know that it's going on <coughs> i don't know how many of y'all have been to hub in the past two years year and a half or so jimmy i've been quite a bit and hub is pretty amazing yes there are many college students there usually but there are many of our families that are there that are not college students and been encouraging to have that time to get to know one another better and to be able to spend those kinds of time periods and experiences, have those together. We have a lot of men here, many congregations struggle to have somebody to speak or to teach a class. We have many here that do that, many men that do those things and lead singing. We have many women that teach and lead singing with women here, and I'm very thankful for that such an encouragement that there's so much going on, so many different hands being involved in it. Many of you may be aware of the Brantwood Children's Home work, and that's even expanding even most recently and trying to have an impact on these teens that have particular needs. We've started a, a visitation initiative, and, and many people have been visited that maybe hadn't had a visit before, but people who have done the visiting may not have been doing visiting before, and they are now. And, and that will help build and encourage you and build your faith and your maturity as a Christian. But I'm so thankful that we have people that are involved in doing it. Similarly, we're working on a community outreach day that's still being designed and worked on, but hopefully will be a little bit later in this year when it actually transpires, and you'll hear more about that pretty soon. Last thing I want to mention in this category, though, really is, is the location of our building. We are surrounded by people that need the gospel. We are surrounded by opportunities. Years ago, I did a mission trip in a little town in South Georgia, and there was the poor side of town and the rich side of town. Uh, we were a lot more well-received in the poor side of town than we were in the rich side of town. So maybe some of y'all have had some experiences like that. Y'all right is not poor, but there are opportunities around us, all around us. And finally, we're part of a body. We are part of a family. And all families have different parts, have family issues that come up and family things that we need to talk about and deal with, and we're no different from that. But we're children of the King. What a blessing. We're children of the King of the universe. And we need to appreciate that, appreciate one another. Whatever faults you see in me or see in anybody else that we go to church with, Appreciate the fact that we're here. We're not out there. Be grateful. Last, last verses I want to read in closing, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. After I leave this, I think Steve's going to lead us in song, and then Bill's going to lead us in a prayer. But before I read it, <clears throat> if, if there is anyone here tonight who, who wants to study more, who wants to reconcile their relationship with God. Please know that door is open. It doesn't have to be right now. It can be sometime tonight. It can be tomorrow, but, but now is the best time. But I just would encourage you to think about your relationship with God. If there are things that you need to repent of, let's repent. Maybe publicly, maybe not publicly, but let's repent and be what we ought to be. If you've never started your relationship, let me encourage you to do that because it is in Christ we're all spiritual blessings to God, all of us. We're family, we have issues, we work on them, and we care. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 10. The Bible says, Christians are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Thank you for your attention. Before the closing prayers, is there anyone who needs to take the Lord's Supper tonight? Raise your hand, please. Do not see anyone, so we'll proceed. We'll look on a few. Sing one last song and then Bill will lead us in a closing prayer. Let's stand and sing this song and then we'll have a prayer. I dare not today what the morrow may bring you.
Let us pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we've had the other opportunity to come together as a family. Father, sometimes in families they hurt. Father, there's sometimes there's conflict, there's strife. But Father, we are thankful that we have you and that hope of eternal life with you one day if we've been found faithful. There are a lot of things going on in the world outside that don't need to affect us in here. But sometimes it comes in. Society as a whole right now is just all topsy-turvy. Conflicts everywhere out there would help us as Christians to have the humility and faithfulness to get along together, understand one another, help us to be vigilant, help us to be observant in those that are hurting, help us to be able to Help those people, help us to be understanding as we develop relationships with one another. Father, we are so thankful that we have the avenue of prayer that we can be comforted in knowing that you are listening to us and that we as a congregation can find hope and solitude together that we can overcome up struggles and strifes that are out there with us right now. All these things we pray through your son's name. Amen. <laughs> 